And then I'm going to let Ashley introduce herself. I'm, I'm co-hosting with her today. So Ashley, please introduce yourself. I think that you are muted. All right. Thank you. All right. So as Sherry said, my name is Ashley uh, Bodkins, and I'm here with, in Garrett County. So I work with the Master Gardener Program and Home Horticulture Education. So I'm so excited to be talking today about Brassica and Brassicacea family with Sherry. Um, I think even though we have like eight inches of snow outside our door, um, yeah. it's still an exciting time to be uh, talking about gardening and, and getting started into the gardening season. Um, I just wanted to do a quick um, reminder that we are going to record this. So I did hit record and by participating, uh, you guys are uh, giving your consent to participate. So thank you so much for your time today. All right, thanks, Ashley. So Ashley and I are gonna just kind of like hop on, hop off, and talk about different slides we're gonna co-present here. So we'll get started and I'm so glad that uh, Ashley pronounced that, that name there. <laughs> we are gonna be talking about brassicas today. Um, you, all, you all may know them also as um, coal crops. Let's see. Ashley, can you forward the screen for me, please? Okay, so we want to let you know uh, who we are because not everybody's uh, always familiar with extension, but we are part of the University of Maryland and we are the part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources that reaches out into our communities and shares research-based information. We not only talk about gardening, but also agriculture, natural resources, uh, family consumer sciences, and nutrition, among other things. All right, forward, please. And we wanna let you know that we are federally funded. And so as such, we need to make sure that we are offering our programs to all, regardless of uh, race, color, sex, identity, expression, orientation, marital status, and all the rest that you see on this slide. We want to make sure our programs are open to everyone. And because of that, we do like to do a little um, opportunity for you to self-identify so that we can report to our funders that we are trying to do our best to, to make our programs accessible to all. And if you have any problems with or any issues with accessibility, we, we welcome you to contact us about that. So right now, Ashley is bringing up this uh, self-identifying poll. You do not have to do it, um, but we appreciate if you do. So there's gonna be just a few questions. If you could go through it now, um, that would be fabulous. So we'll give you a, a minute or two to do that. Yes. Thank you guys for taking the time to do this, Sherry. We're right up at half of the folks that have answered to so just a couple more minutes or seconds, and then we can move on. Okay. All right, thank you all so much. Yes, appreciate it. All right. Close out this poll and see if we can go to the next slide. Um, next slide, please, Ashley. All right, so also we wanna let you know um, that Master Gardeners uh, offers a, a variety of different topics. Today, we, we would consider that a Grow It, Eat It program, but we also offer uh, programs on um, pollinators, composting, native plants. We have our plant clinics or Ask a Master Gardener booth, you might know it as that, and also Baywise or Waterwise, as uh, we call it out here in Garrett County. All right, next slide, please. So I think brassicas are really interesting. And as we were doing research to do this um, program, I did not know this, but um, all of the, the brassica or coal crops that you're familiar with all descended from one species. It's a wild cabbage. 
Brassica oleracea. And um, it represents some of our most commonly eaten vegetables. And we're gonna talk about these individually, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, et cetera. Um, and the reason why they all look so different, I mean, some are leafy and, you know, the cabbage is just like one big head. And then you have um, Brussels sprouts, like a stalk with a bunch of little heads. Uh, on it that you harvest, they all look very different, don't they? Well, and that's all due to selective breeding over hundreds of years. And in fact, uh, Greeks and Romans uh, started doing this. So over a long period of time, you know, people in different cultures, different areas of the world have selected for different traits. And that's how you end up getting these very different looking plants, you know, between leafy things like kale and collards to uh, cauliflower and broccoli uh, which are stalks with little unopened flower buds, you know, you're actually eating unopened flowers when you eat that. Um, so, um, and I think this is kind of neat. I didn't know that Brussels sprouts was actually named after the city and, you know, of the country in which it was um, uh, developed, which would be Belgium. So that's pretty neat. And in Germany, they had a preference for fatter stems, which uh, eventually led to the development of kohlrabi. We're going to talk about that one. Um, so I think that's pretty, pretty cool, but let's move on to the next slide. So what are some reasons to grow brassicas or coal crops? Well, they are, they are actually can be very pretty. Um, you may have even seen some ornamental kale that people plant in the fall, um, to spruce up their gardens. It looks real pretty. You get all these different colors, green and white and pink. Um, and same thing in, in the different uh, plants that we're going to talk about today. But uh, they're also very nutritious, very healthy for you, very high in vitamins, especially um, B6, folate, vitamin K, um, A, vitamin A, vitamin C, even calcium, especially your dark leafy greens. And oh, yeah, you can go ahead to the next one. They're also you know, high in fiber. So th this is a really cool um, planting chart that we have that's offered by uh, University of Maryland Extension. Um, and we have the uh, link to it down here at the bottom, and Ashley may actually put that also in the chat at some point. But this chart is really awesome because it lists all these different vegetables that people grow. It tells you uh, the days to germination, you know, days to, to harvest, and then you'll see all these little different bars and different colors. It tells you when to plant and and if you're doing succession planting, you know how to do that, or whether you put it in a seed or you start from a, you know, um, a little plant. So anyway, it's extremely helpful. Um, it tells, it gives you a layout for when to plant what. All right. So hopefully you can check that out. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so the brassicas we're talking about today uh, are what we would categorize as cool season crops. They grow best in cool weather. Um, 55 to 75 degrees. Uh, many of them, when it gets to be very hot out, uh, they don't do as well. They may stop growing, they may bolt, all these different things. So they prefer cool, cool weather to grow. And um, it also interesting about them is that the nutritional value of cool weather crops is usually higher per pound than your warm season vegetables that you grow. And some examples of cool season crops uh, are the brassicas that we're going to talk about today, but that those aren't the only cool season crops. Also in that category would be asparagus, lettuce, beets, chard, uh, peas, and carrots. Okay, next slide. So the cool season vegetables here, um, they have a, a, I think this is really neat, they have a unique system in which when the, the temperatures get really cold, they create their own own antifreeze, okay? They concentrate sugar in the plant cells and that helps prevent those, those um, cells from bursting. So that's why you can grow these plants and you know, when the temperatures may actually be hovering around freezing or even lower. Um, and actually you may have heard it said that, you know, collards or kale or other things, Brussels sprouts, they taste better, sweeter after a frost. And that's because of this process that they do where they um, con con concentrate the sugar content in their cells. Next slide. Okay, thank you, Sherry. That's a great introduction to, 
to brassicas um, and why we want to grow them. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things about um, some cool things about our plants that that you can grow. So some things about soil temperature and why these plants do so well as cool season uh, crops. Uh, sorry, Sherry, I think we're having some, we're both competing over trying to control the screen here. Um, so this is a cool soil temperature tool that uh, we shared the last class that we did on season extension. So if you go to this greencastonline.com, you can actually enter your um, zip code and it'll give you the average soil temperature for however long of a period that you want to look at. So this is really helpful when we're talking about these cool season crops and knowing when you can actually uh, plant them and when is a good time to get them out in the garden. So, um, you know, with season extension that we talked about the last session that we had, we want to get as much out there as early as we can so that we can get as much production off of our uh, plot of ground. Uh, so this is a cool cool tool that I recommend you check out if you have the, the time. And just a little bit about general um, basics for planting uh, anything in this family, this brassica family. Uh, they like a, a pretty, um, you know, almost neutral pH, so anywhere from six to six and a half. Uh, they're pretty heavy feeders if you've ever grown anything in this family, um, especially broccoli, uh, cauliflower, you probably know that they get massive leaves. Uh, so those massive leaves that they get take a lot of nutrients, especially nitrogen. Uh, so here are some general recommendations uh, for each of the plants if you want to know exactly what to put on. Uh, we always recommend that you do a soil test uh, to know what you have in your in your soil before you get started. Uh, but these are just some general guidelines if you haven't tested your soil um, that you would want to where you'd want to start with. And I just wanted to note that they are very quick growers. They're quick sprouters. So if you are growing them from seed, um, that's it's really encouraging. It's a really fun one to grow, to grow, especially with kids because. They usually sprout almost overnight, especially if you have them like on a heat mat um, or have a really uh, good soil temperature range, then they grow really, really quick. So that's fun. Um, and at least they sprout fast. <laughs> and so that makes it a really good one to do with kids or, you know, if you're an impatient gardener, a good plant to, to start growing with. So I just wanted to put this chart on here. Um, you know, we've talked about how cold hardy some of these crops are, but as you see cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, rutabagas, kale, uh, and mustard, all of these are in the hardy category. And you can see they can take pretty cold temperatures, uh, which is really fun to do because most of the time we think, you know, once it gets below 32, our gardening season is over. And that's not necessarily the case for a lot of the plants in this family particularly. And it's just a, a side note that even though they can take really cold temperatures, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can harvest them when it's that cold. Uh, you really uh, need to let it warm back up to above 30 before you would actually go out to the garden and harvest these crops. Uh, because if you, if you cut them when it's, you know, negative or, you know, in the 20s or even down here to the 18s and 15, um, they're going to be really mushy. So you don't want to, you don't want to cut them and harvest them when it's that cold. And this is another um, piece of information that I always find helpful. And it talks about soil temperature. Uh, so you can see that once we get up to the 60s, up to the 70s and 80s, all of these cool season crops, uh, they generate or they germinate very, very quickly. So, you know, within five days, four days, um, the warmer it gets. But once it gets to a certain too warm, then cool season crops are not going to do well. So um, they every plant has a specific uh, temperature range that they want to germinate at. So just good information to have as you uh, are beginning your gardening season. So as Sherry said, um, <clears throat> we just thought this would be um, some interesting information to share with you. Uh, so we put a list of some of the most common brassicas and uh, you can see our color chart over here. So uh, blue is what Sherry has grown, uh, red is what I have grown, and then the purple is what we have grown together. Uh, so we're gonna be tag teaming talking about these plants uh, specifically. Uh, so I wanted to start with, with um, broccoli. Uh, so we started growing broccoli uh, probably five years ago, uh, my family and I, and it's one of the crops that people tend to overlook, but it's very easy to grow. Uh, two of the varieties that I've had really good success with is Gypsy and Emerald Crown, so they're listed here at the top. Again, it's a very cold hardy plant. Uh, one thing I love about broccoli is that 
Uh, you can cut it multiple times. So you cut the main head, but then if you're patient enough, uh, you will get a lot of side shoots that come up. So you can potentially harvest broccoli for a long time, um, especially if it's just you know a small amount that you need for your, for your family or something like that. Uh, we generally plant around 100 and 100 or so plants every season. And um, the interesting thing is that, you know, it is little tiny flower buds that you're actually eating the flower heads. Um, sorry, my screen went black. Um, so there we go. So the, the head that you are eating of your broccoli, um, it is unmatured flowers. So if you let it go too long, uh, it's going to get to the point where you can't harvest it and it's not going to be good to eat. And if you ever wanted to try to save seeds from broccoli, uh, it's actually a biennial. So it takes two seasons to actually produce seeds. Uh, so usually people are not going to see that uh, in a general garden situation. Uh, maturity ranges from 55 to 65 days from transplanting. Um, and then just some general information about broccoli. Uh, so here's a picture of one of our broccoli heads last season. Um, it's just a beautiful crop to grow. Uh, again, you want to harvest it when it's nice and tight before uh, those little flowers start to mature and bloom. Uh, there are several different types of broccoli. We generally do the heading and we've done Romanesca. Uh, I've never done sprouting or rob, um, but it's very closely related to cauliflower and we're going to talk about that uh, next. A good thing to note about broccoli is that it does need a good bit of water. Again, if you've ever grown it, you know that it has massive leaves. Uh, so those leaves take a lot of nutrients and a lot of water to really get grown before you get the, the head itself that you can um, eat. Uh, so next is cauliflower. It's not nearly as hardy as broccoli, uh, but still a really fun plant to grow. Again, we started growing this about five years ago. Uh, one of our uh, people that buy from us, they really wanted colored uh, cauliflower for something different. So we uh, set out to try to explore how to, how to do this. Um, so again, semi-hardy, so not nearly as hardy as, as uh, broccoli. Um, the bummer about cauliflower is that you can only harvest it once. It does not get side shoots. Uh, so, you know, you want to make sure that you let the, the head, uh, the curd get as large as, as possible before you do harvest it because you're only going to get um, you know, one cutting off of that plant. Um, here are some pictures. This is some of the uh, different varieties that we've done. This was um, like a Romanesca variety, uh, and this was a graffiti. So this is my daughter. You can see she's holding it. So it's, they get pretty large heads. Uh, and this is my hand, so uh, just for reference, so they can get some really, really nice heads on them. And I just love growing uh, this cauliflower. Uh, so there are different varieties. Uh, a lot of the new hybrids are going to be something called blanching or self-blanching. Uh, so it used to be if you've grown a cauliflower in the past, you would need to, um, you know, go out and tie the leaves over top of the curd to keep it from turning color. Uh, but you really don't have to do that if you get a variety that's self-blanching. So uh, the leaves kind of grow over top of it itself so that's a lot less work that you have to do, which is really nice. Um, and of course, these are going to do better in, you know, early in the spring. Once it starts getting too hot, uh, you can have some discoloration occurring, uh, which doesn't really affect the flavor, but it does affect the marketability and what people want to, of course, purchase. So here's another picture uh, from a couple years ago of uh, cauliflower that we grew. And then um, this yellow variety here is called cheddar. Um, and I forget the the dark, dark purple was graffiti and this other lighter purple. So depending on what variety it is, it can kind of change what it's supposed to look like. And that can affect the, again, the marketability. And then there was, um, this is white that we did last year was called early snow. Uh, so next on our list, we have cabbage. Um, again, another really easy plant to grow. Uh, one great thing about cabbage is how long it lasts after you harvest. Uh, certain varieties can really hold well in the field as well, which is nice. Uh, we've grown um, some varieties that are usually smaller. So these are actually uh, something called cabbage babies. Uh, so they're a smaller variety that get just a little bit larger than um, I would say a softball, uh, which makes marketing them again a little bit easier because we found that people don't generally want 
um, you know, a head the size of a soccer ball. That's just uh, too much cabbage for most people. Um, so smaller varieties we found are a little bit easier. And again, uh, they tend to hold a little bit better in the field so they don't split as easily um, or things like that. Again, they get large, large leaves on them. Uh, so it does take a good bit of space. I like to space things out, you know, at least 24 inches in the garden uh, to make sure that, that they have enough room to grow with those leaves. Uh, this was another variety that we grew a couple years ago. It was a Caraflex. Uh, so it actually is a pointed variety. And a lot of people think that it's, it's not nearly as dense of a head. Uh, so sometimes it's a little bit better for things like, uh, you know, coleslaw um, or cooked cabbage. It doesn't quite do as well for things like sauerkraut where you really need to pack it uh, tightly to get a good uh, finished product. Uh, so uh, there's some different varieties like the Savoy. Uh, they have the crinkly leaves. That's kind of becoming a lot more popular now with a lot of chefs. Um, so again, this was the Cabbage Babies triplet hybrid varieties that we did a couple years ago. And again, they stay pretty small. Um, and in that seed packet, you get three different varieties of cabbage. So that's kind of fun, um, fun to grow if you're starting seeds from, your, from yourself. Next on our list, we have Brussels sprouts. Uh, Sherry talked a little bit about them already. Uh, the cool thing about them is that they do get sweeter with um, a frost. Uh, some other things to note about Brussels sprouts is that if you've never grown them, uh, they're a very long, long season crop. So we, we start them at the beginning of the season, we put them in the garden, and they're going to be in that spot for the rest of the year um, until usually the end of November when we start to harvest them. Uh, so you, you're not going to use that space for anything other than Brussels sprouts uh, in, in Garrett County because it's going to be devoted to that one, that one plant. Uh, but as the, the plant grows, everywhere that there is a Brussels sprout, there was a leaf. Uh, so you can actually, as the plant gets much more mature, you can cut these leaves off uh, to kind of help encourage the Brussels sprouts to mature a little bit quicker. Again, the more often they get uh, frosted, the sweeter they're going to be. Uh, so that's kind of good to know. Uh, I will say Brussels sprouts are a little bit harder because um, like with harvesting them, you might not think about it, but Harvesting them can take a long time because cutting off each one of these little tiny sprouts. Uh, so just be, you know, be prepared for that if you are going to grow Brussels sprouts. And we've had issues, a lot of issues with insect pressure on them, uh, just because they are in the garden for such a long period of time. And Sherry's going to talk a little bit about uh, insect pests here in a little bit. Just some general information um, about Brussels sprouts. Whoops. Uh, we are going to send everybody a copy of our slides, so uh, you don't worry about having to take notes. Uh, we will have these uh, information for reference. And each of the plant profiles are also found on the University of Maryland Extension website. Uh, so if you want to learn specifically about one uh, plant or the other, you can also, uh, we'll put that link in the chat here in a little bit. All right, Sherry. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So we get on the kale. Okay, so um, I like to grow kale and collards. We don't have a slide for collards, but they're um, pretty similar to kale, other than the fact that collards are, they have a very large leaf, kind of a rounded leaf, almost looks like those cabbage leaves. And it's a much thicker leaf. Um, you're not gonna eat that raw. It's gonna, you're gonna cook that. But I do like it because it's kind of meatier. But let's focus on, kale right now. So it's a leafy green and uh, you can plant that about four weeks before your last frost date in spring. And I live in Garrett County, Maryland and uh, we're zone five. And when I plant kale, it never bolts or anything like that. It's, I have it in the ground from say mid April all the way through frost. And I'm able to continuously harvest from that. And uh, I just take leaves off, don't take the whole plant out. And then the plant just keeps putting out new leaves. So that's um, that's pretty good, pretty neat. Uh, you can also harvest the inner leaves if you want small leaves, tender, more tender leaves for salads, etc. Now the kale can come in um, different colors, as you can see from these pictures over here on the right hand side. Um, so the ones that I have grown and have had good success with are Red Russian, uh, the Toscan Toscano in particular, and I've tried many, I've never had any problems with any particular variety. Um, 
I do like the the flatter leaf, like you'll see with the Toscano and um, the Red Russian, which I don't have a picture of that here, but the Red Russian is a, a, a blue-green leaf with a purplish uh, mid-rib, mid-rib and uh, veins, and it's, it's really pretty. Um, but it, you know, some people like the curlier varieties, like you see down here in the, the bottom of the screen, and that would be more like your, your red boar hybrid and um, even the, the dwarf Siberian. So um, those are, are awesome to grow. They're very high in vitamins, very good for you. They're great in smoothies, uh, do stir fries, boil them, uh, tender leaves and salads, can find all kinds of ways to use this plant. Um, and the kale plants themselves probably need, to, they're, they're fairly large. They need about a foot in between plants. So when I sow them in the spring, I, I sow a seed about every four inches and then thin them so they're about um, a foot apart. And I usually do about two feet in between rows and that does fine. And in fact, um, I have them planted in an area that's part sun. So this is one of those crops uh, that if you don't have full sun in your backyard, you can, you know, you can put them in part sun and, and they'll do okay. I mean, they may not put out as many leaves as they would in full sun, but um, they still do, they do just fine. Okay, um, I think that's probably all I wanted to say about that. So Ashley, you're gonna talk about kohlrabi? Um, yeah, I sure can. So uh, this is one of those uh, plants that doesn't seem to be utilized a whole lot uh, by people. Um, it's one that I was never really uh, grew up with. Uh, my mother and father-in-law actually uh, turned, sh showed me this crop and I'd never uh, really known anything about it before that. Uh, so it's one that's kind of like it tastes across to me like between a turnip and a radish. I would say it's kind of spicy if you let it get a certain, you know, a little bit larger. Uh, it's great uh, to eat raw. That's how I personally like to eat it. Uh, you can put it in salads. Uh, we've even also, when we've had <laughs> excessive amounts of them, uh, we've even like boiled them or broiled them in the oven um, and like roasted them and made them like really sweet like that. So um, a really easy crop to grow, really one that can go in the garden pretty early. A lot of the information that I read about them, uh, recommended that you direct seed them. But um, here in Garrett County, I've always planted them as a transplant. So I start them early and then, you know, put them out in the garden as an actual plant. Um, so I don't have a whole lot to say about that. Sherry, did you, I think you've grown kohlrabi, right? Yeah, I have a few times. Um, I enjoy growing it. It's, you can also eat the leaves. Uh, I think that's something that people don't think about, but you know, it's just like kale or, uh, collards or cabbage so that's you can eat the whole plant that's a good thing and my dog liked to go in there and pull it out by the leaves and eat it in the middle of the yard I don't even know why but uh he loved kohlrabi <laughs> he thought it was delicious right it was he good did. for him yep okay so next we have radishes to talk about um, and they're one of the, I think, very much underutilized uh, vegetables that people don't grow. Uh, the thing I love about radishes is how quickly they actually mature. Uh, so, you know, you see here, uh, within 25 days, you can have a crop of radishes, and often the smaller they are, uh, the better they tend to be. Uh, that's my biggest uh, problem with them, is I usually tend to let them get too large. Uh, so that can be a real problem. Once they get too big, they get woody um, and they're just not appetizing then at all. So make sure that if you do plant uh, radishes that uh, you, you know, you, you harvest them more often than you think and thinning them is also a problem. Actually, a couple years ago at one of my programs, a lady gave me a radish uh, salad, but instead of using the actual radishes, it was the radish leaves. Uh, which to me doesn't seem like it would be that appealing, but she swore up and down that it was the best salad ever. And I've not, I've not actually tried it, but it might be something you want to try for something different. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to say about it is here in this picture, um, Sherry and I both talked about this, that we have used radishes as a companion planting. Uh, so flea beetles really like to go to those radish leaves so they can, um, that can help take care of some of your flea beetles. And I've also interplanted them here uh, with my cucumbers to help uh, with um, cucumber beetles. Uh, so that's something that's really nice. You can see the white flowers here in my high tunnel. Uh, this is the cucumbers growing up. Um, and then with uh, nasturtiums that we use for companion planting for squash bugs and then uh, the radishes, you can see the flowers. We didn't harvest the radishes, we just let them go uh, to help with hopefully keeping the larva of the uh, cucumber beetles at bay. Sherry, anything you want to add? No, I just, yeah, I like growing radishes. My favorite is uh, French breakfast. Uh, I Like with some of the other, like the rounder varieties, I just haven't had really good luck with, but with French breakfast, I get success every time. So yeah, I like that one. And I, I plant it around the edges of my gardens to, um, well, it, it's cool because they only take like a month to, to be ready to pick. And so you can kind of interplant them in between your other plants, like your kale and your collards, use up some of that space in between those plants and it's not there for very long. So it's a good way to make use of uh, space early on in the season. All right, so next on our list is horseradish. Uh, so this is one that I wanted to just touch on. Um, I have family members that have grown it. I've never actually uh, grown it myself, but it's something that's on my to-do list. Uh, something that I would like to try. Um, one thing you need to note about it is that it's very aggressive. Uh, so it propagates by root cuttings. So anywhere that there's a little piece of horseradish, it has the potential to grow a whole new plant. Uh, so just be careful with that. Uh, we had the same situation at our house with comfrey, uh, which is a type of herb and it, it also propagates by root cuttings. And once you till it or anything like that and break all those roots, it, it can become very much aggressive and invasive. Uh, one thing about horseradish is um, it's a perennial. So once you get it established, it'll come back year after year, which you don't harvest that fall uh, to actually eat. Uh, the other cool thing I read about is that whenever you are grinding it up, uh, the longer that you let it sit before adding your vinegar, uh, the hotter it'll get. So <laughs> that's pretty interesting to me. So if you don't want very spicy horseradish, uh, make sure that you put that uh, vinegar on there pretty quick after you grind it uh, to stop that uh, the enzymatic reaction. So uh, if you try horseradish, please let me know how it goes. I would love to hear your stories. Okay. And uh, wrapping up, we wanted to talk a little bit about rutabaga and turnips. Uh, they're very similarly, similarly grown. Uh, we did uh, rutabagas in the high tunnel a couple years ago as a fall crop, um, and they did pretty decent. Um, you know, the end of the season, they always get a little less uh, care than at the beginning of the season, um, but they got fairly large. And if you've never grown either one of them, um, they tend to not have a whole lot of flavor in my opinion. Um, you know, a lot of people have told me that they used to be grown to help extend um, like your potato crops. So a lot of people used to grow them, you know, uh, years and years ago, and they would mix them in with potatoes because they just would take on the flavor of whatever they were cooked with. So again, very easy uh, to grow. Some of the turnips have a pretty short uh, growing season as well. So, uh, you know, you can put them out fairly early in the season and get a couple crops if, if you really, really like turnips. So Sherry, anything to add on those? Uh, no, I was asked, answering a question about uh, horseradish. They were asked, someone was asking if uh, you could grow it in containers. And I said, I think so. It's probably yeah, good. Definitely. Just make sure it's a, a deep enough container. Yes, great advice. Yes. Okay, with that, we're going to move on to bok choy or pak choy. Sherry, you want to take over here? Oh, yeah, pak choy. I forgot about that one. <laughs> So um, this is a, a Chinese cabbage. I like to use that in all my Chinese uh, stir fries. Um, and the ones that I've grown have been like smaller varieties and they've actually worked really well in a, um, uh, a window box and I have up on the deck. And you can, you know, take leaves or you can cut off the entire head and uh, put it in whatever you're cooking. Um, yeah. You may have heard of it called bok choy or pak choy. It's it's the same thing, and um, I plant. I just planted the seeds directly in the soil. Um, probably 
I think I did mine probably early June and it, it did just fine. Um, I don't think I really have anything else to say about that, except I enjoy trying something new with that. And then we have arugula. This is one I do like to grow every year for sure. Um, I love it in salads. It's just kind of, um, it's got a little bit of a bite, a little bit bitter. Um, it's just is really nice in a salad mix and it's pretty easy to grow. I, uh, I can put it in, you can put it in containers and that would be just fine. It does get kind of tall though. I mean, um, but mostly when it puts out flower stems. So this is one that definitely will bolt when the weather gets warm, it'll send up its shoots for flowers. Um, you can try and uh, head that off a little bit and keep, the, keep it producing leaves for a little bit longer by cutting off those flower stalks. Um, but generally in the middle of summer, this plant is, is finished because it's just too hot, it just doesn't really like it. And uh, so you can, I would definitely, this is one I would plant early in the spring. And then again, um, the end of the summer, you know, getting ready for fall. And it's very, like I said, just, it's easy to grow. And you just, instead of pulling out the whole plant, you know, you just take leaves as you need them. So cut and come again, kind of treatment. And uh, it's, a, it's a good one. Okay, I'm going to continue on talking about pests here. Um, so I've got listed here some of the pests you may encounter when growing brassicas. Uh, deer and rabbits are always an issue, slugs and snails, aphids, and then there's a whole slew of caterpillars of various moths that will feed on your plants and uh, make a complete wreck of them if you don't protect your plants. I've never gotten through a season without having to deal with caterpillars. Uh, harlequin bugs are an occasional pest, white flies, occasional pest. Flea beetles, uh, I, yeah, I think you see them pretty much every year. Okay, next slide, please. So I have good news for you. Almost all of these pest problems can be avoided by using this one simple thing. And you're thinking, what? Next slide. Reveal, here it is, floating row covers. This is like, Amazing, okay. You can stop almost all those pest problems except for snails and slugs. I've still had snails and slugs under the row cover. Um, so what is row cover? It's just a, a lightly spun polypropylene cloth and it helps to hold heat in. It helps to keep pests out. It can provide uh, frost protection. It does come in different weights or thicknesses. So I usually, for the summer, I'm just gonna be using like the lightest weight possible. It's, fairly, it's pretty affordable. I buy it at a local nursery and usually buy it by the foot. You can buy it online. Um, but as soon as you plant your, either whether it be seeds or um, starter plants, you wanna cover your crops immediately, but do leave um, some excess there. So as the plants grow, uh, they can push up on that cloth and they won't, their growth won't be restricted. But you do need to make sure that that cloth is secured to the ground, you can use some kind of like staples or tacks or soil or rocks or whatever you need to do. Because those butterflies, if they find a little, you know, gap underneath, um, they will fly in and lay eggs on your, your leaves. So next, next slide, please. Oh, and also I wanted to uh, also say that those row covers allow light and water in. So that's, that's good. Okay, so we're going to slide here with your different caterpillars. Uh, I just wanted to show you some pictures to help you kind of identify them. Here in the top center is a cabbage looper. Um, you can see, you know, if you ever seen an inchworm, they have that little hump in their back as they move. So that would be kind of a, a giveaway to tell you that's a cabbage looper. Down in the lower left corner is an imported cabbage worm. That's the one I see most often on my cabbage every single summer. I have that um, little, just a little green caterpillar. And if you go over here to the, the, um, the right side of the screen, you'll see inside my orange circle, there's, you see like these little white squiggly. Those are the caterpillars when they first hatch out. I mean, they are tiny, right? Um, they might be like a 16th of an inch and you should be scouting for things, these things throughout the summer. You can look for the eggs and you can look for these little caterpillars or you'll actually find the larger uh, caterpillars. And it's important to scout so that you can get these under control early. But 
like I said, your best bet is to use a row cover because none of these brassicas need pollinators. So you can put that row cover on at the beginning of the season and leave it on the whole growing season and you will not have an issue. Um, and uh, also up here in the upper left corner, I have a picture of a diamondback moth cocoon. That's also something that I've seen on the under, underside of my leaves and wondered what in the world that was. So that's what that is, help you identify it. Um, if, if you opt not to use row covers, some things that you can use that are biological controls and are therefore less, uh, less toxic than, than other chemicals would be uh, Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki. That is a bacteria or more commonly known as BTK. And that only affects the larva of moths and butterflies. Another one that is a biological control is spinosad. This is also a bacteria. Now this does affect um, larval forms of also other insects besides um, moths and butterflies. And of course, if you're brave enough, you can hand pick the large caterpillars. And um, BT and spinosad are effective against uh, younger or smaller size caterpillars. As the caterpillars mature and get very large, those things may not work as well. You may need to use something a little stronger, although I don't really like um, suggesting it, but um, for those of you who, who need it, there it is, malathion and carbaryl. Those, uh, those also do uh, kill bees if, they, uh, if it is applied directly on bees, so you have to be careful with that. Next slide. Okay, so this is also something I've seen on the underside of my uh, brassica leaves. These cocoons of a wasp, it's called a, a braconid wasp. And these are good, you wanna leave these. Okay, so out of these little cocoons will hatch tiny little wasps that will parasitize those uh, caterpillars that are feeding on your leaves. They will insert eggs inside of the caterpillars, which will then develop and kill your caterpillars. So you see these, leave them there. Next slide. Okay, flea beetles. Um, I don't think you can get away from flea beetles. I've seen them every year. Uh, they're, these are tiny little black beetles that are maybe um, a 16th, maybe an eighth of an inch long. Uh, they have very powerful hind legs. They jump really fast. So uh, you may not see them, but you will see their damage, which you can see in this picture. Uh, they make these little holes and they especially like to attack your seedlings. And these are um, the first leaves that come up um, and they like those tender leaves. So I think they're probably the biggest problem when your, your plants are young and tender. So uh, one thing that you can do is to um, do transplants instead of growing from seeds, seeds, excuse me. And when you have a transplant, it's got many, uh, many leaves, true leaves, and as the, the plant matures, the leaves become tougher and the flea beetles uh, cannot feed on them as easily. So that's one uh, workaround. Uh, of course, row cover. Um, and these adults do overwinter in leaf litter and debris. So it's important to clean up your gardens in the fall because as soon as the temperatures start to warm up in the spring, if you have debris there on uh, the adults are there, they will lay eggs in the soil and then those will hatch out um, late spring, mid spring. And even if you have a row cover, um, if you're covered up, there, these new adults are emerging from the soil. So you could still have a problem. So scout your plants, get rid of your debris. Um, we already talked about radish as can be a, a, a trap crop. Another interesting thing that you can use is kale and clay. And uh, if you spray that on your plants, it, the way it works is it just distracts the beetles so much because they can't stand it. They're constantly cleaning themselves, trying to get this clay off that they stop feeding on your plants. All right, next slide. Uh, you may have a problem with aphids. I never had that big of a problem, but uh, it's always important to scout, look at the underside of your leaves, look for these soft bodied insects. They have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, and they suck the juices out of the plants and the damage that they can cause is, you know, yellowing, curling of the leaves. And eventually if you have enough of them, they will um, kill the leaf entirely. Also, they um, excrete um, honeydew. This is a waste and uh, you can get um, mildew growing in that. So you wanna uh, make sure you get that under control, but they're not so hard to 
to eliminate. Um, you can actually um, blast them off your leaves with a strong stream of water. Of course, you have to do it on the underside of the leaves. You can use reflective mulch if you grow in plastic mulch. Row cover, of course, will help uh, with this problem. And then you can use some of your lower uh, risk um, pesticides such as horticultural oil, horticultural soap, or neem. Next slide. Okay, white flies are another soft bodied insect with piercing sucking mouth parts do similar damage to, as uh, aphids do, but um, sometimes you can get this kind of silvery look to your, to your leaves there you can see. And so you wanna scout for these, row cover will help with this problem. I think maybe this problem may be more pronounced in greenhouses or in uh, high tunnels. You can also use insecticidal soaps, horticultural oil, neem to get these under control. Uh, one biological control you can use for this is uh, Bovaria bassiana, which is a fungus. So if you're looking for a biological control, that's a good one. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have harlequin bugs, which um, Ashley has said she's had some trouble. I, I haven't. Um, you can see the feeding damage that she's over here on the right hand side. It's kind of very characteristic. This is a stink bug. It's actually very pretty, um, but I think unless you you are inundated with them, you're going to see a little bit of damage, but maybe not. You know, take out your whole crop or anything like that. But um, one way to control that is to remove some host plants, uh, weeds that are in the brassica family, like wild mustard, shepherd's purse, peppergrass, and bitter cress. Scout for eggs. And these eggs are really cool. Over here, you can see they're black and white striped, little bare looking things um, laid in rows. So look on the underside of these for that. You just cut them out and boy, you have really headed off a problem. And that, that holds for uh, other pest insects as well. Next slide, please. And finally, slugs and snails. And I think the reason why the, the row cover does not work for this is because they lay their eggs in the soil and if you have mulch protecting your soil, the, the eggs are going to be laid in that. So even when you cover your plants with the row cover, because they are in the, the soil in the substrate, the eggs hatch and you still get you still get slugs. Um, so I think really the easiest thing to do for them is you can set traps, uh, like leave a board near nearby and they will collect underneath that board and then during the day especially and you'll pick that up and then you'll you will have to collect the slugs off of that sorry uh, they are a slimy mess so um you might want to wear gloves when you do that so collect them and put them in some soapy water you could make a beer trap I always like to joke that it's kind of a, a waste of good stuff <laughs> waste of good beer and who wants to see a bunch of slugs floating in your beer but anyway that does actually work you can put a shallow dish in the ground there, um, level with the soil, and uh, you'll catch your slugs in there. Uh, and one thing that I think is uh, really easy to apply is slug bait, but I use iron phosphate because that is relatively non-toxic around children and pets. Unlike some bait, uh, the other baits that contain uh, metaldehyde, which is um, is more toxic, so I avoid that one. All right, next slug. I think I or next slide. I think that's it for pests. Okay, <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Those are great pictures. Um, the worms are definitely the, or the caterpillars are definitely the, the most popular that we see. Um, so moving right along, uh, we are getting short on time. So we're just going to flip through some of these uh, diseases. Uh, this is something called black rot. Uh, you will see it showing up as yellowing on the outer leaves uh, surface. I think unless you're growing uh, these in the same spot in your garden year after year, um, and you're growing them in large numbers, you probably aren't gonna have a lot of problem with uh, diseases, but uh, we did wanna include these for your reference. So um, black rot, it will also be characteristic in the stem um, on the xylem and phloem bundle. So you'll see the blackening uh, there, uh, which indicates that there is a bacterium in the plant. So just keep an eye out for that. Uh, like I said, we're gonna go through these pretty quick. Another one is something called black leg. I like when these diseases are rightly named uh, where you can actually, you know, by the name of it, you'll see the, the symptom or the change in the plant. So uh, you will see it characteristic uh, here on the black stem or the black leg of the main 
uh, part of the plant. Um, and it is a fungus, uh, so you will also be able to see that uh, the fungal spores, um, you know, here in the leaf spots as well. Um, we put the, the link here uh, to where we got the information off of an extension fact sheet. Uh, so after the fact, if you want to go back and research these diseases, please feel free to do that. Uh, next, we have alternaria leaf spots, another type of fungus. Um, we see alternaria on several different other plants. So, you know, concentric rings look like a bullseye uh, that often coalesce or fall out. That's a good indication that, you know, you do have a fungal issue. Um, it can actually get pretty, pretty ugly, um, you know, if left go. Uh, again, a lot of these diseases, the more humid it is, wind and rain, uh, that also helps to spread them around. So like with any uh, plant, when watering it, always try to keep water off of the leaves. If you can do it early in the morning, so it has all day for that water to, you know, get dried off. That's also a good idea um, to, to kind of get that water um, to be able to, to dry naturally instead of doing it at night, uh, you know, in the evening, whenever uh, the water is just going to lay there and, you know, potentially breed lots of other fungal diseases. Uh, downy mildew, this is another one, again, that we see across a lot of different species. Uh, the good thing to know is that a lot of these, like downy mildew, it can't jump from your brassica family over to your squash or anything like that. They are specific varieties of downy mildew. Um, so just because you have it on one plant doesn't mean that it's going to jump. But again, a different type of fungus, and it's going to be silvery or white uh, kind of looking uh, here on the plant itself. Powdery mildew, another one, again, we see on a lot of different plant species from vegetables to ornamentals. Again, it can't jump from your cabbage over to your black eyed Susans, um, but again, it does like, you know, moisture and more available water can also help to um, make it be a little bit more aggressive. So um, if it's just not a real bad infection, you can just pinch it off, you know, get it out of the greenhouse or out of the, out of the garden to help prevent it from spreading. Um, but there are some, um, fungicides that you can also use. All right, Sherry, I had you were gonna start picking up here. Can you hear me? Sorry, I lost the, uh, <laughs> the mute button there. Okay, so um, a sclerotinia white mold is um, this cottony growth that can cover the inf infected plant parts. And I haven't personally seen this very often, but uh, it can happen. So it, uh, it has this, uh, the stems have bleached, light gray, desiccated appearance. And the, in it, you know, initially the lesions may start out small and circular, and circular um, but they may rapidly increase in size. So, you know, be careful to make sure you are scouting for diseases get this under control, yeah. And then club root, um, this is kind of interesting. It actually will, this is a, a, a deformed root that you see here on the, the left-hand side, and it will actually um, cause your plants to become stunted. They won't grow very well. So your crops with fibrous roots, such as cabbage and broccoli, um, they, they can get these club-like spin um, swellings on individual roots. So a low pH of less than 6.5 and uh, particularly wet conditions like we have in Garrett County can favor this disease. And it's actually um, caused by these spores that uh, actually can swim and move in, in water, in water drops to infect plants and roots. And these spores can survive many years in the soil. Next slide. Okay, fusarium yellows of cabbage and related crops. So you can see the yellowing on your leaves here and eventually the, um, the lesions can coalesce and kill entire leaves. So the plants can develop these characteristic symptoms in two to four weeks after transplanting and um, the, little, the lower part of the leaf blade um, wilts and dies first, so you want to keep an eye out for this. The, uh, the speed at which it, this progresses depends on the degree and variety, variety 
and how susceptible it is to Fusarium yellows. So you might want to look for, if you've had problems with that in the past, you might want to look for varieties that are resistant to this. So uh, plants of some varieties growing in the 75 to 85 degree uh, soil temperature may die with actually within two weeks of getting this. So we'll go to the next one. And hollow stem. So this is actually um, a problem due to a lack of nutrients. So it's a physiological disorder, okay? And it once you have this problem, you get rotting, which is caused by secondary pathogens. So uh, broccoli and collards may have this disease, and you know, has similar symptoms, and it's called hollow stalk um, caused by a soft rot bacteria. And it's caused by a boron deficiency. Now, boron is a micronutrient in the soil that is, you only need a very, very small amount of this. You have to be careful. Um, you can see how the stems of this, of these broccoli heads are hollow and that's caused by the boron deficiency. And if you, if you ever have a problem with this in your, in your um, brassicas, you might wanna do a soil test and then do a micronutrient test to see what your boron levels are. And if you, you find that you have a deficiency, then you may need to add some to the soil. You can, the source of uh, boron you can get from borax, uh, which is, you can find out in a grocery store. Um, but be very careful because you only need very tiny amounts. Uh, so if you add too much, you can, uh, you can have problems of a different sort. Okay, all right, next slide. And then we have some lists here of disease resistant varieties. And I know it's gonna be hard for you to read, but we, we have this slide in here because we wanna suggest that um, you should go and visit this website at the bottom of the screen here. And we will have these websites with links in our follow-up email that we send out to you after the presentation. So this is a good source for finding disease resistant varieties. And there are some of our references. All right, great work, Sherry. <clears throat> so there was a question in the chat box uh, for you specifically about, do you not need to uh, fence your garden? You said your dog was in there. So if you wanna verbally answer that one. Uh, no, fences are always good. I had the gate open and he went in and pulled. <laughs> and I found remnants in the yard and I was like, what the heck? And then I realized he had gone in and pulled the kohlrabis out. So yes, you definitely need a fence to keep critters out unless you have dogs that roam all the time, you know, night and day to keep out the deer and the rabbits, et cetera. Uh, fence is definitely recommended. All right, wonderful. Well, uh, we thank you all for spending some time with us this afternoon. We hope that you learned um, a lot of things. Uh, we are gonna put up one last uh, set of poll questions. If you would just um, take a minute to answer those, we would appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions in the meantime, while we're um, doing this poll, then um, please go ahead and an enter them in the chat. We did put a few of the links um, there in the chat. So um, the, um, the production information that Sherry hit on, um, that link is right there. I just dropped that in there. So if you were looking for a specific plant uh, for varieties, that guide is like 400 pages long. So it's a little overwhelming, um, but it's broken down by plant um, family uh, and it has all the information that you would ever need to know from, you know, uh, pesticide information to control weeds or, um, you know, pests or anything like that. So. We just thank you guys for supporting us. Our next class is, I believe, next Monday. Um, so we can drop that link in there, too, if you let me stop sharing my screen. Um, I will do that. Sherry, anything you want to add? No, we just really appreciate you all coming and joining us once again. We love talking about this stuff and uh, answering your questions. So thank you very much for your continued support. Yes, I agree. So I will find um, the link 
if anybody's interested in signing up for our next class next Monday. Um, and if you would just go ahead and uh, finish that poll and then we will um, we'll definitely be sending out a copy of the recording as well as the slides, the PDF of the slides. Uh, so you will get that in the next um, week or so if nothing happens. Um, let's see, yeah, our next class is April the 4th and it's going to be on spinach, beets, uh, Swiss chard, and lettuces. And again, that'll start at 1215. And if you have not registered, I will drop that uh, link in the chat. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. And if you have any other questions, just drop them in the chat. And we thank you guys and hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone.